Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Just before Pierre Bourdieu passed away, he delivered the Huxley Memorial Lecture in 2002 and it came as a paper, as a, as a research paper in the journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute uh, in 2003, where Bourdieu stated that science as a force must go beyond the absolutist idealist conception of the immanent development of science and historical relativism of those who construe science as a purely conventional social construct. When Bourdieu pointed out absolutist idealist conception of the immanent development of science, it is it refers to the internalist debate. And when Bourdieu referred to historical relativism, it comes under the externalist account of science. Okay? We must go beyond these two dichotomies. We cannot construe dichotomies to understand science. We must go beyond the construction of such dichotomies. In fact, E. Haribabu once wrote in sociological bulletin that the distinction between the internal and external worlds of science is not rigid, but porous. We just cannot uh, 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 make a distinction between internal and external worlds of science. Literature suggests that uh, 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 the earlier literature suggests that uh, no science is internally driven, science develops on its own as a Science does not depend on social norms, frameworks for development, but today what we see that no science also is determined by the kind of state that we have, by the kind of society that we have, by the kind of uh, moral frameworks that we have, the kind of ethical frameworks that we have. And it is guided by certain epistemological questions. Now, let us go to what, what constitutes epistemology. Epistemology is a theory of knowledge or a body of knowledge, but why is it so? Epistemology is always referred to as a body of knowledge or a theory of knowledge, precisely because of the questions that epistemology addresses. The questions are what is knowledge, how is knowledge produced, how is knowledge generated, but the, pro, the, the proponents of epistemology, the scholars of epistemology perhaps forgot to ask one important question that was knowledge for whom, who possesses that knowledge, who owns that knowledge. How is knowledge dis distributed? Whether knowledge is distributed on an even basis or not, then we encountered a subdiscipline within philosophy that is called history, uh, sorry, ethics. Okay? If you combine epistemology with ethics, then we get philosophy of science. Okay? That is why whenever we talk about STS, we must look at not only epistemological concerns, but also ethical concerns. Ethics, what is, what is ethics? Ethics uh, is a study of nature of conduct, but why is it so? 
as we discussed in epistemology that it is a theory of knowledge or a body of knowledge. Uh, why is it so? Be just because the kind of central intellectual political philosophical questions that epistemology addresses. Similarly, why is ethics known as or considered a study of nature of conduct precisely because of the central intellectual, political and philosophical questions that ethics addresses. Ethics also addresses I mean what is good? The questions include uh, what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. These ethical considerations must be taken into consideration by the scholars of epistemology to bring about a robust philosophy of science. Okay? And philosophy of science, history of science, sociology of science, they always look at these considerations. Perhaps uh, in general, in general, if you look at uh, uh, many, many, many scientists, they do not look at science as, as a uh, science uh, on a philosophical real. Okay? Very few scientists do that. Mm, uh, 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 for example, Einstein, okay, he did that, Bernal did that. I mean, uh, in fact, scientists themselves, they have come out of that internalist um, or uh, the kind of linearity uh, that science possesses, they have come out of that. And what they have achieved that we see uh, in this kind of relationship between science, technology and society, philosophy of science, history of science and sociology of science. Okay. When we discuss, when we say that the relationship between science and technology and the relationship between science, technology and uh, science and technology on the one hand and society on the other, okay, one can say that uh, I am trying to go ahead with again the debate, debating the controversies. Okay? Uh, one may say, no, science can develop on its own, technology also can develop on its own. That is known as technological determinism. Okay? Technological determinism postulates the idea that technology develops as the sole result of an internal dynamic and then unmediated by any other influence molds society to fit its patterns. Okay? This is a case of internalist account, but how ST scholars try to challenge this position of internalist debate, internalist account of science. How scholars of STS, scholars within STS, they try to challenge the proposition of technological determinism. Okay? What we say, whether a technology is neutral or not or whether technology determines human action or not okay, depends on the way technology is designed and the way technology is controlled. Okay, let me give you an example from the construction of the New York Bridge by Robert Moses. Robert Moses planned this bridge in the 1960s and 70s in the US. He was a famous engineer, no doubt about that. He built, a, built the New York Bridge of 9 feet height. At that time, the public buses were of 12 feet height. Now, you see the, now the public buses cannot enter that New York Bridge. Okay? Now, if you look at this, now the construction of the New York Bridge by Robert Moses and who uh, Robert Moses had different uh, uh, 
kind of agenda, political agenda, social agenda for this. At that time public buses were used by the blacks and the poor. Hence, the construction of the New York Bridge by Robert Moses reflects racial prejudice and class bias. That is why technology is also politically shaped, socially shaped. Okay? How you design your technology and how you control your technology. Okay? I, let me give you an example of from Indian context the way uh, public roads in India are designed, I always we always feel that the way they have been designed, they are always anti pedestrians. Okay? I can, uh, we can go on and on in giving this kind of uh, 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 examples, uh, uh, that is why uh, uh, when I say technology uh, is not neutral, this is an externalist account of science, this is an externalist characterization of science, uh, technology or science. Okay? Technologies have inherent political properties. From this example of the construction of the New York Bridge, what we can conclude? What matters is not technology itself, but the social or economic system in which it is embedded. Social system, economic system, cultural system, political system is very much important in the context of the evolution of a technology. The, the formation of technology. Machines, structures and systems of modern material culture that we see today, they are known not simply because of efficiency and productivity or positive and negative environmental side effects, but the way they embody power and authority. There is a difference between power and authority, but I do not want to dwell upon this right now. Uh, very often we say that uh, authority is legal, whereas power is not legal, but I am not going to discuss this right now, because it requires a different course altogether to deal with this. That is why when we say power and authority are very much embedded in the formation of a technology, in the evolution of a technology. Okay? I, I reiterate the point that what matters is not technology itself, but the social or economic system in which it is embedded. Then what kind of implications that we have, if, if technology is very much politically uh, uh, designed. Okay? It has then it will have implications on our political economy, labor, agriculture, health, environment and so on. Okay? Now, the implications that we have we are trying to discuss that <coughs> they can be seen at the level of cogniz cognitive and political scenarios okay? and such cognitive and political changes include political economy, labor, agriculture, health and environment. Okay? That is how science, which was once considered a curiosity driven research has been translated into contract obligations. I mean scientific knowledge, which, which uh, has hitherto been considered under public resource or considered a public resource has been translated into an intellectual property. This, this such transitions have taken place. Okay? Now, what we have discussed till now? What we have discussed? We started with technology, we started with science and the relationship between technology and science and then the relationship of science and technology on the one hand and society on the other. And then we provided 
three models of the relationship between science, technology and society namely the linear model, the interactionist model and the embedded model. And from linear model and the interactionist model what we observe that they ac account for the internalist characterization of science and technology whereas, the embedded model accounts for the externalist characterization of science. Who, who is the main proponent of the internalist characterization of science and technology? It is Karl Mannheim. Karl Mannheim suggested that all knowledge except scientific knowledge is socially and culturally conditioned. <coughs> As against this, the embedded model guided by the externalist characterization of science and technology suggests that no both science and technology the two forces of production they are very much a part of society. For this Bloor said all knowledge including scientific knowledge is socially caused, Kuhn said uh, uh, science must be seen in terms of its historical integrity how science and technology have evolved over time and across space. And then we try to provide how science and technology are inherently political, artifacts are inherently political. We can also uh, discuss uh, uh, how a particular technology may be neutral, may not be neutral such universalistic notion about science was challenged by STS scholars. In this context, what we generally find is that there are two views which have become very prominent. One is technological determinism and the other social determinism. The, the first one suggests that you no know, everything is determined by technology. The other one suggests no everything is determined by social formation, but we want to mediate the two. In this context Bourdieu's interventions are important that no we have to go beyond such dichotomy. Okay. Perhaps for this reason what we are trying to do that that we are trying to give certain example through which we can say that no technology is not neutral. That is why we discussed the example of the construction of the New York bridge by Robert Moses, how the construction of the New York bridge uh, 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 reflects racial prejudice and class bias. Again when we look at uh, the design of public roads in India how it is uh, how public roads uh, or the construction of public roads is anti pedestrians. We have to look at the, 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 uh, the way a particular technology is politically, socially, economically amplified. When if you look at uh, the 1980s era, you will find you will find that when computers were installed in India there were many stakeholders who uh, uh, who accepted computers who rejected computers and a portion of the indian populace was also maintaining its ambivalence towards this that they didn't know whether it was good or bad ethically speaking because when computers were installed, so many people also lost jobs. But now, can you can you can we think of life without computers? That's why technology. But at the same time, those who rejected it at that time in the 1980s, rejected the installation of computers, can also not be nullified, precisely because of the time and space that we are talking about. Okay. We must mediate, we must be able to mediate human action with technology. Okay. 
I, I, I repeat what is, what, is, what is this kind of technology? Technology is the medium through which we are trying to interact with nature. We are trying to uh, um, establish social uh, political re relationships. Okay. In this sense, we have discussed technologies have political properties, technologies are not neutral okay. precisely because of the wage technologies have evolved over time. Technology also has evolved by keeping some objective in mind. If you look at the, the invention of electric bulb, why we said uh, that it is a curiosity driven science was a curiosity driven research electric bulb was invented by Edison. When what was the objective of creating electric bulb? He wanted to ensure that the city life should not be at the level of darkness, so it should not be at the realm of darkness. It should always have light, there cannot be any night the distinction between a day and night uh, must be purged upon, the dis such distinction must be removed. Okay. Now, let us look at, look at such, such uh, curiosity driven research, how they have become a part of contract obligations. You will find that uh, such curiosity driven research, uh, now there are more funding bodies they fund our research, it has become a part of contract that you want to develop a seed or you want to develop a medicine. For this contract, uh, you enter some kind of uh, uh, agreement. If you succeed in providing that particular output, then the contract uh, remains valid or else you have to dismiss that contract. Okay, it's a, it has become a part of contract obligations. Okay. The way I, we discussed it science is a, as a public resource, now it has become a part of intellectual property. Okay. If you look at this, we also look at this phenomenon uh, as a part of contract obligations. Now, the way scientific knowledge and the associated technological artifacts were owned by the community, were owned by the state, were owned by the collective. Now, it has become a part of individuals or groups intellectual property. The others do not get access to use that. They can use that only after a payment of royalty. Okay. We will we'll discuss in detail about these things, uh, we will discuss these things in detail uh, towards the last modules of this course. Okay. A very warm welcome to the CSS MOOC course on science, technology and society. What we have discussed till now? Very quickly, I will try to uh, recapitulate whatever we have discussed uh, uh, till now for almost one hour. What we have discussed, we started with the, uh, uh, the way technology, science, and the relationship between these two forces of production namely technology and science and the relationship of technology and science with society have been conceptualized over a period of time historically. And then we started discussing three different perspectives on the relationship between science, technology and society namely the linear model, the interactionist model and the embedded model. 
whereas on the one hand you find the linear and the interactionist models depict the internalist characterization of science, the embedded model indicates the externalist account of science. That is why the embedded model suggests that the relationship between science, technology and society is symbiotic in nature unlike the linear and the interactionist model which suggested that uh, uh, or which treated science, technology and society as separate entities, as distinct entities. Whereas, the embedded model suggests that no, they are not separate or distinct entities rather they are uh, um, rather both science and technology are very much a part of the social formation. Okay? this is. From there, we have discussed the, uh, the debate between internalism and externalism within STS by taking three disciplines in mind, philosophy of science, history of science and sociology of science. And therein lies certain epistemological questions, which for a long time ignored the aspects of ethical considerations. But when scholars drawn from philosophy of science, history of science and sociology of science, they tried to combine epistemology with ethics, we tend to see the challenge for the demarcation, uh, autonomy and cognitive authority of science. Okay? We will we'll come to this point when we will discuss methods of science. Okay? But bef before, before discussing methods of science, we also discussed how technological artifacts involve political properties. That is why we discussed technological determinism, which suggests the idea that technology develops as the sole result of an internal dynamic and then unmediated by any other influence mold society to fit its patterns. But then we also discussed uh, how, tech, uh, how this erroneous version of technological determinism uh, has deeper implications for the way we conce conceive of our economy culture and polity. Okay? That is why whether a te technology is neutral or not, it depends on the way a specific technology is designed and that particular technology has been controlled. That is why we gave the example of the construction of the New York Bridge by Robert Moses, where we uh, find that the construction of the New York Bridge uh, uh, reflects um, racial prejudice and class bias, because it ignored the, the, the two important social classes namely the blacks and the poor. Okay? Uh, from this what we came to know that machines, structures and systems of modern material culture, they do not reflect or they should not be examined only in terms of efficiency and productivity or positive and negative environmental side effects, but the way they embody power and authority. What matters is not technology itself, I repeat what matters is not technology itself, but the social or economic or cultural system in which it is embedded. This is how we, we encounter two technologies, two types of technologies which have concurrently existed side by side. I am referring to Louis Mumford's delineation of two technologies, one authoritarian and the sec and two democratic. When I when Mumford talked about authoritarian technology, it he referred to the system centered immensely powerful, but inher inherently unstable technologies. And when we talk about democratic technologies, it implies that it must be human centered, relatively weak, but resourceful 
and durable and hence sustainable let me give you an example you talk about large dams okay even nehru when he spoke about uh, uh, large dams he said uh, dams are the temples of modern india he was referring to dams in a different political context he was referring to uh, uh, such technological interventions in a different political realm but when you look at uh, the way this imagination of uh, 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 technology the imagination of technologized nation the the uh, the imagination of uh, of of uh, of a country say india only in terms of technology has deeper implications for the way uh, uh, it can envision its own future okay for it doesn't imply that large dams do not have any uh, 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 have any merit i mean uh, they are responsible for hydroelectric power generation still when you look at the way it has caused havoc in the forms of displacement in the form of taking the life and livelihood of the indigenous communities i think we must examine it examine the construction of such large dams afresh okay perhaps for this reason we need uh to include the concerns of different stakeholders while designing a te technology while controlling a technology that's why we need we we have an urgent need for democratic technologies okay democratic technologies may sound relatively weak but but they are immensely resourceful durable and hence sustainable we can go back to we can go back to gandhi ji hind swaraj uh, uh, we can go back to uh, ef sumakar's delineation of uh, uh, small is beautiful which he, uh, of course the the he borrowed this term from uh, uh, core but if you look at these these uh, 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 the conception of uh, i mean the the way uh, gandhi visualized na uh, 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 a nation a colonized nation okay uh, vis a vis appropriate technologies if you look at sumakar's delineation of appropriate technologies then what we find especially gandhi was writing uh, uh, against the backdrop of anti colonial struggles okay that's why uh, he he was in favor of khadi i mean home spun cloth uh, he was in favor of charkha system he was in favor of self employment by incorporating different appropriate technological systems when we we'll, when we uh, that, that that's why when uh, gandhi wrote in hind swaraj that let's not copy england that's why uh, he said uh, if india copies england it is my firm conviction that she will be ruined that's why when we develop a specific technology we must develop a specific technology in our own context we should not copy or ap others for the development of technology we must design our own technology keeping our own interests in mind keeping our own citizens in mind keeping our farming communities in mind and so on okay i mean keeping the vulnerable sections of the society keeping the marginalized sections of the society in mind in this sense we are uh, 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 we are discussing uh, uh, these two technologies okay and such as as we have discussed earlier that that such such uh, uh, transition which has taken place in the form of knowledge production okay it has uh, it is that is a transition from curiosity driven research to contract obligations 
from public resource to intellectual property and so on. Okay. Such cognitive and political changes we have discussed how they have deeper implications on our political economy, uh, the components of labor, agriculture, health, environment and so on. Okay. We can give examples, I mean uh, if you look at uh, uh, the, this, uh, these cognitive and political changes, okay. when I say they, they are two profoundly destabilizing changes in the form of cognitive and political changes. When I say cognitive change, it refers to the shift that occurs from monovalent to polyvalent knowledge. Uh, I mean the triple helix model supersedes both traditional disciplinary boundaries and mode to knowledge production created in the context of application. What I mean here is that the if you if you try to understand if we try to understand such cognitive shift okay cognitive change that earlier notion was that only academia will be engaged in teaching i mean universities will be engaged in teaching industry will be carrying out research that was some kind of a monovalent knowledge products, monovalent form of knowledge products. Okay? One should not uh, enter the territory of the other, universities should not enter the territory of the industry. So, also industry should not enter the territory of the universities, but then what we found in the 1980s onward at least in India that universities and industries they started entering into collaboration, collaborative practices. Now, complementarities of expertise drawn from both universities and industries they became the hallmark of polyvalent knowledge, what we say mode to knowledge production. Okay. What I mean triple helix model of innovation, I mean when government also takes over. Government which remained a non-active participant has become an active participant in the triple helix model of innovation. Okay. But government, the state which was the sole sponsor of scientific research till the 1990s in India is no longer a sole sponsor of scientific research today, at least in India. In this context, the nature of the state assumes greater significance. What kind of shifts that we have seen in the nature of the state, which takes us to the discussion on the political change changes which we witnessed today. When I say political change, I mean the shift towards a fracturing of the authority of nation states with consequent pressures to rethink the forms of democratic governance. It, it requires certain skills. Triple helix model of innovation suggests that you take government, academia and industry, I mean private R and D institutions into consideration, but, but one more helix is missing out. Now, what is the role of the citizens? How are citizens going to be taken into consideration? How is public going to be taken into consideration? Perhaps this is a missing link, which, which perhaps the world of science and its practitioners must take into consideration and therein lies the job of STS scholars, okay? science, technology and society studies scholars. Okay? The political changes indicate or raise the questions of citizenship, raise the questions of territoriality raise the questions of law, raise the questions of nation state and so on. 
in this context we must keep in mind that what what is and what ought to be what is is important what what is uh, uh, that there is a philosophical debate that uh, uh, the the uh, uh, ontological questions i mean uh, uh, debating the ontological questions i mean what is in reality what is real what is existing what is being from there on what we wha how we move forward that what should be what ought to be then the normative the prescriptive framework gets foregrounded from from uh, uh, but uh, to bring about that prescriptive framework that normative framework the normative institutional framework we must look at the ontological aspect i mean we must look at the reality having 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 done with the ontological aspects how technology is designed how uh, uh, technology is controlled that's why i gave you the example that the way public roads in india the way public roads in india are designed they have become anti pedestrian okay then but if you if you uh, if you look at several other countries okay who have got the 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 fast right over the roads or streets many countries also have taught us that the pedestrians must have the fast right they must get the top priority so far as access to public road circles is concerned but 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 in many underdeveloped countries but in many developing countries what we find that uh, uh, access to public roads or public streets okay is uh, uh, is i mean uh, the pub, the way public roads are designed uh, it has been designed in such a manner that pedestrians find it difficult to uh, cope with uh, such design okay then what ought to be what ought to be uh, in the world of science and its practitioners okay takes us to the to the formulation of the normative uh, structure of science normative framework of science propounded by robert morton okay this normative structure of science when i look at okay morton was writing after the second world war morton was a, let me give you a brief brief uh, uh, um, overview about morton morton was a structural functionalist uh, uh, i mean he was a functionalist within the discipline of sociology uh, 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 functionalism uh, believes in the way uh, society is constituted on the basis of complementarity and reciprocity of roles i repeat functionalism is based on the idea or based on the way in which society is constituted on the basis of complementarity and reciprocity of roles okay i mean uh, there are there are also uh, 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 counter perspectives uh, to uh, functionalism uh, for uh, say um, uh, marxism marxism is uh, uh, marxism opposes functionalism for marxism suggests that no uh, society is constituted not on the basis of complementarity and reciprocity of roles rather the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles that was Uh, a statement which uh, marx made in the manifesto of the communist party of 1848 okay i mean there 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 are different perspectives but so far as uh, uh, sts uh, i mean i mean the normative structure of science is concerned uh, let us discuss martin first